Welcome back to the deep dive. Ready to explore something um, pretty wild. Absolutely. Always up for a cosmic adventure. Awesome. Today we're taking a deep dive into the world of exomoons. Exomoons. Yeah. You know those mysterious moons orbiting planets outside of our solar system. Oh, right. Exomoons, like uh, those tiny hidden worlds we're just starting to uncover. Exactly. And trust me, the more we learn about them, the more mind-blowing it gets. I bet. But before we get ahead of ourselves, can we back up a bit? For those who uh, might not be familiar, what exactly are exomoons? Great question. So imagine our moon. Right. But instead of orbiting Earth, it's orbiting a planet in another star system. Got it. So like miniature versions of our own solar system, but on a whole other level. Precisely. And the thing is, these exomoons, they can hold some pretty big clues about the universe. Clues about, uh... Well, everything from how planetary systems form... Okay. ...to the possibility of life beyond Earth. Whoa. Hold on. Life on exomoons? Is that really a thing? It's definitely a possibility. Some scientists believe that exomoons might actually be even more habitable than some planets. Really? More habitable than planets? How is that even possible? Well, think about it. Some exomoons could be orbiting gas giants within the habitable zone of their stars. The habitable zone, right? The sweet spot where temperatures are just right for liquid water. Exactly. And that liquid water, that's a key ingredient for life as we know it. I see where you're going with this. But wouldn't those exomoons be tidally locked to their planet? Uh -huh. You're thinking about how our moon always shows us the same face. Right. And wouldn't that make one side scorching hot and the other freezing? Not exactly ideal for life, right? That's a good point. But it's not always a deal breaker. Especially if the exomoon is orbiting a gas giant in a system with a red dwarf star. A red dwarf system. Yeah. In those systems, the moon wouldn't be tidally locked to the star itself. It would still experience day and night cycles. So even though the planet might be tidally locked, its moon could still have a regular day-night cycle. Precisely. And that means it could potentially be more habitable than the planet itself. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, but there's got to be more to it than just the right temperature and day-night cycles, right? You're absolutely right. There's another factor that could make exomoons even more intriguing, and that's something called tidal heating. Tidal heating. Yeah. It's basically the gravitational pull of the gas giant creating friction within its moon. Friction. Yeah, like an internal tug of war. And that friction, it generates heat. Okay. And that heat can melt ice, creating subsurface oceans, and even power volcanic activity. Whoa. So you're saying these exomoons could have internal oceans and volcanoes. Talk about extreme environments. It's pretty wild, right? And those extreme environments, they could actually be hot spots for life. Hot spots for life. You mean like... Uh, extremophiles, those organisms that thrive in harsh conditions? Exactly. Just think about the ecosystems that could exist on these exomoons. It's like something straight out of science fiction. This is mind-blowing. But hold on. How do we even know these exomoons exist? I mean, they must be incredibly difficult to find. You're absolutely right. They're tiny compared to their host planets and incredibly faint. The methods we usually use to find exoplanets, like looking for dips in starlight. Yeah, I know about that, like when a planet passes in front of its star and blocks a little bit of the light. Yeah, exactly. But that method, it just isn't sensitive enough to detect most exomoons. So scientists have had to come up with some really clever tricks. Clever tricks like? Well, one of them is called transit timing variations, or TTV for short. TTV, okay, what's that all about? Imagine you have a planet with a moon orbiting a star. The moon's gravity, even though it's tiny, it's still going to tug on the planet a little bit. Okay, so like a cosmic tug of war. Exactly. And that tugging, it causes the planet to wobble slightly as it orbits the star. I see. And we can actually detect that wobble by very carefully timing how long it takes the planet to pass in front of its star. So the moon is basically messing with the planet's schedule, and we can see that from Earth. You got it. And there's another method that works on a similar principle. It's called transit duration variations, or TDV. TDV, okay. It's basically looking for tiny changes in the length of time a planet's transit takes. Again, these are super subtle clues, but they can tell us that a moon might be lurking nearby. It's like being a cosmic detective, piecing together these tiny clues to uncover a whole hidden world. It really is. And you know what? These techniques, they aren't just theoretical. They've actually led to some very exciting discoveries. Discoveries, like actual exomoons. Tell me more. Well, one of the most intriguing candidates is a possible volcanic exomoon around the planet, WSP-49b. 
WSP-49b. Okay, I've heard of that planet. It's a gas giant, right? It is. And scientists have detected this huge cloud of sodium near it. Sodium, like table salt sodium. Yep, the same stuff. But here's the thing. The sodium cloud doesn't seem to be coming from the planet itself. Interesting. So where's it coming from? Well, the evidence suggests it might be coming from a volcanic moon spewing out material like crazy. A volcanic moon? Wow, like a supercharged version of Jupiter's moon Io. Exactly. But there's a catch. This moon, even if it's real, it might be doomed. Doomed? Why? Because the planet's gravity is so strong, it could eventually tear the moon apart. Oh, wow. Talk about a cosmic tragedy. It's like a moon born of fire and destined to be swallowed by its own planet. It's pretty intense, right? Yeah. But it just shows you how dynamic and unpredictable these exomoon systems can be. Okay, so we've got one potential volcanic exomoon. What else? Are there any other candidates that have scientists buzzing? There are definitely a few more. And one that made big headlines a few years ago was Kepler 1625 BI. Kepler 1625 BI. That rings a bell. Wasn't that thought to be a massive moon, maybe even Neptune sized? It was. And the initial data from the Kepler Space Telescope looked really promising. But sadly, further analysis cast some serious doubt on its existence. Oh, so it was like a false alarm. Kind of. It's a good reminder of just how tricky exomoon confirmation can be. The signals are often very faint, and there can be other explanations for what we're seeing. So it's back to the drawing board for Kepler's 1625BI. But there have to be more candidates out there, right? Oh, absolutely. And one that's particularly exciting is a rogue exomoon called 2MSS J1119 LN137 AB. A rogue exomoon? What does that even mean? It means it's not orbiting a planet or a star. It's out there on its own, just drifting through interstellar space. Seriously? A moon without a planet? That's wild. I know, right? And the coolest part is, we actually have a picture of this one. Hold on, you're saying we have a picture of a rogue exomoon? We do. It's like a snapshot of a primordial Earth still in its early stages of formation. So like a cosmic time capsule. That's incredible. It really is. And with the James Webb Space Telescope, we might even be able to analyze its atmosphere and learn more about the conditions that existed billions of years ago. This is blowing my mind. We've gone from searching for exoplanets to finding potential exomoons, and now rogue exomoons are just out there cruising through the galaxy. Pretty amazing, right? And the best part is we're just getting started. The hunt for exomoons is still in its early stages. I can't wait to see what other incredible discoveries are waiting out there. Me too. And speaking of incredible discoveries, we'll be right back after a quick break to delve even deeper into the world of exomoons. Stick around. We're back and ready to dive even deeper into the world of exomoons. These rogue exomoons we were just talking about, they really make you wonder what else is out there lurking in the darkness. It's like the universe is full of these hidden treasures just waiting to be discovered. Exactly. And each discovery just adds another layer of complexity and wonder to our understanding of the cosmos. Well, before we get too carried away with the mysteries of the universe, I want to circle back to something we touched on earlier. Okay, sure. What's that? We talked about the possibility of exomoons being habitable. Right. Potentially even more so than some planets. Exactly. But why? What makes them so special in that regard? Well, it all comes down to a few key factors. First, you need a moon orbiting a gas giant that's situated within the habitable zone of its star. Okay, so the Goldilocks zone, where temperatures are just right for liquid water. You got it. Now imagine that moon also experiences tidal heating from its host planet. Tidal heating. Yeah, the gravitational pull of the gas giant creates friction inside the moon generating heat. And that heat can melt subsurface ice, creating internal oceans and even power volcanic activity. So these exomoons could be like a giant cosmic hot springs. In a way, yes. In those kinds of environments, they could be teeming with life. It's like a whole hidden biosphere just waiting to be explored. Precisely. And don't forget the possibility of geothermal energy sources as well. That's another potential energy source for life. Geothermal energy. Yeah. Think about it. Some of these exomoons could have active volcanoes and geysers spewing out heat and chemicals that could support entire ecosystems. It's amazing to think about the diversity of life that could exist out there, even on these seemingly hostile worlds. Absolutely. And who knows, maybe some of these exomoons are even more hospitable than Earth itself. Maybe they have more stable climates or more diverse environments. So exomoons could be the ultimate cosmic real estate. It's definitely a possibility, but finding them and studying them, that's the real challenge. Speaking of challenges, earlier we talked about a couple of those method scientists used to find exomoons like TTV and TDV. Right. Clever techniques. 
But they only give us indirect evidence. Exactly. But there are other methods out there, aren't there? There are. One that's particularly fascinating is called microlensing. Microlensing. I'm not familiar with that one. Well, it's based on Einstein's theory of general relativity. Oh, boy. Here comes the physics. Don't worry, it's not that complicated. Basically, when a massive object like a star passes in front of a more distant star, its gravity bends the light from that background star. Okay, so it acts like a giant cosmic lens. Exactly. And if that foreground object has a moon, it can create an additional bump in the brightening pattern. So we can actually see the effects of the moon's gravity on the light from the distant star. Precisely. And that's how astronomers are using microlensing to search for exomoons. It's a really powerful technique, especially for finding those rogue exomoons we talked about earlier. Rogue exomoons, those lone wolves of the cosmos. Exactly. And microlensing is one of the best ways to track them down. Because let's face it, trying to find a tiny faint moon that's not even orbiting a star, that's like searching for a needle in a cosmic haystack. More like searching for a needle in a haystack that's constantly moving. You got it. But that's what makes exomoon research so exciting. It's pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible and forcing us to think outside the box. And it's not just about finding these exomoons, it's about understanding their significance, right? Absolutely. Every exomoon we find tells us something new about the universe. It adds another piece to the puzzle of how planetary systems form and evolve. It's like having a whole new set of data points to work with. Exactly. And the more data points we have, the better we can understand the big picture. Well, I'm definitely starting to see why scientists are so obsessed with these exomoons. They're not just pretty objects in the night sky. They're keys to unlocking some of the biggest mysteries in the universe. And we're just getting started. With new telescopes and technologies coming online, the future of exomoon research is incredibly bright. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here, talked about the challenges of finding exomoons, those clever techniques scientists are using, even touched on some really cool candidates. Yeah, and don't forget those rogue exomoons out there on their own drifting through space. Seriously, those things still blow my mind. But with all this talk about the present, I'm kind of curious, what's next? What does the future hold for exomoon research? Well, I'd say the future is looking incredibly bright, actually. We're on the verge of some major breakthroughs thanks to new technologies and this uh, global collaboration among scientists. Okay, so new tech. When I think about that, the James Webb Space Telescope immediately comes to mind. It's already making waves in astronomy, but how will it impact the search for exomoons specifically? The JWST, it's a total game changer for us. It's powerful infrared vision. It lets us see things that were basically invisible before. Okay, so like peering through cosmic dust clouds and stuff. Exactly. But even more than that, we can use it to study the atmospheres of exoplanets in incredible detail and potentially the atmospheres of their moons as well. So like, we could actually learn about the composition of an exomoon's atmosphere. We could. We could figure out what kind of gases are present, their temperatures, maybe even detect what are called biosignatures. Biosignatures. Wait, are you talking about signs of life? We are. Imagine that. Finding evidence of life on an exomoon, it would be a monumental discovery. It would rewrite textbooks, that's for sure. Yeah. But yeah. JWST isn't the only player in the game, right? There are other missions coming up that'll contribute to the search. You're right. One that I'm particularly excited about is the ESA's Plato mission. Plato, yeah, I've heard of that. Wasn't it designed primarily to find exoplanets? It was, but its capabilities go way beyond that. It's gonna be searching for those tiny dips in starlight caused by transiting planets. And with its incredible precision, it could also detect those subtle wobbles that tell us a moon is present. So it's like a cosmic detective, carefully watching the movements of planets to uncover their hidden companions. Precisely. And the data from Plato, it'll be crucial for confirming candidates found by other methods like TTV, TDV, or even microlensing. It's pretty amazing how all these different missions work together to build this complete picture. You know. It really is a testament to the power of collaboration in science. And as we gather more data, our understanding of exomoon formation and evolution will just keep growing. We'll be able to test theories about their origins, their relationships with their planets, even their potential for long-term stability. It's not just about finding them. It's about figuring out their story, their role in the grand scheme of things. Mm, exactly. And who knows what surprises are waiting for us out there? What if we find an exomoon that completely redefines our understanding of habitability? What if there are worlds out there that are even more suitable for life than Earth? 
It's mind-boggling to think about this whole deep dive. It's been a real eye-opener. We went from the basics of what exomoons are to exploring their incredible potential for habitability, even talked about pushing the boundaries of what we consider life. It's been a fantastic journey, and I hope it's inspired our listeners to learn more and keep exploring the mysteries of the cosmos. Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh -huh. So to everyone out there, keep looking up, stay curious, and keep those questions coming. This is The Deep Dive, signing off.